Greetings, everyone, and thank you for coming back to discuss uh, the next chapter in the book, The Compensations of Plunder, How China Lost Its Treasures, Chapter 2, Accumulating Treasures. I know you're saying I have to be here, right? You assigned the chapter of the book. I have no choice. And <laughs> yes, that is true. Uh, but uh, we'll just try to make the best of it and make this as interesting and educational as possible and hopefully as painless as possible. Let's try to go through this a little bit faster. <laughs> than usual if we can. Um, so this chapter opens up with Paul Paleo once more. Uh, I, I swear to God, when I was writing this, I actually did not realize that I had two chapters in a row that open up with Paul Paleo having some sort of an interaction uh, with uh, uh, his counterparts, the people he's interacting with in China. Uh, but now that I'm sort of in hindsight, looking back at this, I'm like, hey, the symmetry of this actually works quite well. Both these chapters open up with Paleo's exchange of things, uh, of artifacts, with either the lower class Muslims that he's hiring for manual labor, or the elite Chinese, the educated elite Chinese Confucian officials uh, who facilitate the logistics of his expedition and give him all the help that he needs. It actually works out really well uh, to see the difference between the two openings um, in this chapter. But I swear I didn't plan it this way when I was actually writing those chapters. I only realized it afterwards. All right, so let's start off. This is the guy that Paleo is interacting with. He's actually Manchu, uh, the ruling house of the Qing Empire in Beijing. Uh, during this time period is the Manchu dynasty, who uh, allied with some eastern Mongol tribes and some northern Han families to then conquer the rest of China and then gave themselves privileged positions in the Qing imperial bureaucracy. Uh, all of them, however, are going to uh, become eventually educated in the Confucian educational mode. All right, so even if they're Manchu, Mongol, Han, whatever, we can refer to all of them essentially as Confucian officials or educated Confucian uh, elites, uh, regardless of what their ethnic background is. So Prince Zilan is, uh, well, he's a prince, he's related to the, the uh, royal clan. Um, and here we see him in exile in Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang. And we see him uh, very much as he wants to be portrayed. Uh, I had to scan this out of a book. I couldn't find this online anywhere, so it's not the best quality. Uh, but we see him as he wants to be portrayed. Here he is. He wants you to think that he is a cultivated, educated, refined Confucian gentleman, surrounded by works of art, little teapots and bronzes um, and books. And here he is reading it. Obviously, it's a staged photograph. Um, this one was taken by Gustav Mannerheim, who was with Paleo at this time period and then later separated because they got into a fight and didn't like one another. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he's very carefully tending to his self-image. Uh, here he is uh, also with some of his other uh, uh, fellow uh, Confucian scholar officials and probably a servant or two uh, at his pagoda in Urumqi. All right, the classic educated Confucian gentleman. All right. And what we see here opening up this chapter is we're seeing a counterpart case study to the three terracotta heads that Paleo uh, had lost, uh, was trying to recover from his poor, probably illiterate Muslim laborers. Remember the, guy, the Muslim laborer who was trying to give it to a, a, a would-be girlfriend, uh, and then she ends up pregnant and whatnot. Remember that anecdote in the last chapter, Sahib's in the desert. Now we're seeing the counterpart to this in which we have, again, exchange of antiquities, different valuations. What is this stuff worth to me? And everyone has a different value, valuation. That's what makes this so interesting. That's what we're trying to recover. Because today, all educated people in all countries throughout the world, we have been educated to believe that all artifacts are priceless because they all have a political agenda. We're told they represent, they are emblems of our nation which goes back into the primordial mists of time and somehow represents some fundamental aspect of our identity. That's all bullshit and nonsense. Uh, it's a form of brainwashing, essentially. But we're educated to believe this. Okay? I, um, I'm the same way. <laughs> uh, I was educated to believe that as well. So each person here, however, this is at a time period where only really the Western archaeologists had this priceless valuation of these artifacts as a symbol of nations that they say my empire represents or may represent one day in the future. Right? And that is what gives it the priceless valuation. Other people, the lower class laborers who provide muscle, they might see it as profitable or worthless. Remember that. Uh, now we're going to see local domestic elites. Our case study is Confucian elites, but there's going to be local domestic educated elites in every single country. And they bear a large part of the responsibility for helping to facilitate the foreign archaeologist and let him get what he wants. Okay. Um, and we see here that even though 
Prince Cylon and Paul Paleo had fought on opposite sides of the Boxer War in the year 1900 when Beijing was invaded by eight foreign empires. Um, time heals many things, he says, right? When he meets them in Urumqi in 1908 uh, or 1907, if it, it, it's one of those two years. Um, and, uh, you know, he says time heals a lot. Time heals a lot. And they also bond over something. They bond over their shared appreciation of the Chinese cultural past. And because Zilan sees in Paleo a mirror image of himself, another cultivated, educated gentleman scholar who's interested in the Chinese past, wants to study it, preserve it, and take what he's learned and show it to the rest of the world, that's admirable. That's admirable. And he says, I want to have good relations with this guy. And he gives him a gift of a manuscript from the Secret Cave Library, Cave 17 at Dunhuang, which had only recently in the last couple of years been trickling out into the northwestern regions of the Qing Empire. He says, this is really valuable to me. It's precious, but it's not priceless. I will exchange this for something that I deem is just as valuable in return. What is he getting out of it? When he gives Paleo a 1,000-year-old ancient Buddhist manuscript from Dunhuang, what is he getting in return? He's getting social capital. All right, social capital, maybe even a little bit of political capital, because Paleo is powerful and influential. He might be able to put in a good word for Zilan when he gets to Beijing um, and uh, help Zilan come back from exile. He's in exile precisely because of his role in the Boxer War. The Western powers wanted some scapegoats, and Zilan, as a member of the royal clan, was one of the scapegoats. He was one of the generals. He was involved in the wars. I know he doesn't look like a general here, um, but yes, he's also a politician, very much involved in these sorts of things. Um, so, what we want to talk about here. Uh, here, here's Prince Zilan again, not with Paleo, with some other foreigners. Um, a Confucian Manchu, right? Or domesticated, um, domestic, domesticated, we're not talking about dogs here. Uh, a domestic educated elite in any non-Western country, all right? When he gifts an antiquity, makes a gift of an antiquity like a Dunhuang Sutra to a Frenchman like Paleo, I want to draw out here. It illustrates three important points. The first point is that in the eyes of Zilan, anyone can become a connoisseur of Chinese civilization and collect its antiquities. All right, Zilan is not saying this belongs to my nation. It's a rep it's a priceless emblem of the Chinese nation. He doesn't believe in the Chinese nation. He's very classist and elitist. He's going to believe in the preeminency of the Manchu royal clan and the fraternity of educated Confucian uh, elites like himself. He's not fraternizing with the vulgar, illiterate peasants in the fields. Are you kidding me? That's not his nation. And he would openly talk crap about them if you asked him. Those aren't his people. That's the transformation that we're all going to undergo in the course of the 20th and 21st century. Okay, so in his eyes, this isn't something that's sort of already owned by an abstract entity like the nation. Human beings own it, flesh and blood individuals. I own it. I can do whatever the hell I want with it. I want to give it to this guy to impress him and get social and perhaps political capital in return. And he doesn't need to be Chinese or Manchu or, or even Confucian. He just needs to be educated and appreciate what I appreciate about this historical document. And he does. So even Stein or Paleo, here's Paleo looking quite dapper in another photograph. Uh, there's only a few photographs that we've seen of him so far. Uh, I only have the one in the book of him in Cave 17 where he's very scruffy and scraggly uh, on the expedition trail. Uh, let's give him his uh, fair due and show him looking very dapper, uh, all dressed up and whatnot. This is when he was in Russian Turkestan right before he entered Xinjiang, the northwestern region of China where these Silk Road expeditions take place. Okay, uh, so Prince Zilan, this member of the Manchu royal house, Confucianized in education, he regards the manuscript in his possession, this ancient antiquity, as his personal property to do with as he chooses, just like the boy emperor Puyi after he abdicates after the 1911 revolution and then has 13 more years where he's allowed to remain in the Forbidden City. Puyi, who is actually related to Zilan, they're both members of the royal clan, um, Puyi regards everything in the Forbidden City as his, his family's personal property. This doesn't belong to the Chinese nation. What the hell? This belongs to my family. The virtue of my royal clan and my ancestral emperors I deserve to have this stuff. It belongs to me. I've inherited it because my ancestors accumulated it by their virtue. 
the virtue that propelled them into power and allowed them to maintain power. It doesn't belong to the Chinese nation, and he sells it. He sells the things in the Forbidden City to raise money for his living expenses. It's a very similar thing. Well, not quite the same, but it is similar to what Zilan is doing. Zilan is not facing an economic apocalypse like we're going to see many Chinese people facing after 1911 revolution. Uh, but it's similar in how they regard these ancient antiquities. Mine. <laughs> uh, I get to do with it what I want. It's not priceless. It's precious. And it can be exchanged. It can change hands. When it's priceless, you're going to put it in behind a, a, glass, ca uh, a glass cabinet. And it's only going to be taken out for study or with an explanatory placard to educate and transform the masses who go into a museum to see it. It will never transfer possession again because it's priceless. There's nothing you can give me that can equal the uh, perceived value of a priceless artifact. Okay. Two, educated Confucian elites derived a different form of capital from art and antiquity and its role in their relationship with a Western archaeologist, all right? Different from the lower classes that we saw in the last chapter, Sahibs in the Desert. To Ceylon, let's get him back in here. To Prince Ceylon, Paleo is not a Sahib. It never refers to him as a Sahib, okay? And neither man feels compelled to perform what Paleo so eloquently said in French as noblesse oblige with the other. None of them say, I have an obligation of noblesse oblige to you where I'm in a higher social and political and economic position than you, and I, do, I need to show you grace and favor and lavish uh, resources upon you for giving me a service. That's my obligation to the lower classes. No, no, no. They don't regard each other like that. Okay? Um, Paleo is a gentleman. He is a cultivated gentleman just like Prince Zylan. So what do you get from a fellow gentleman, educated, scholarly gentleman? Prince Zylan is obtaining social capital. All right now, if Paleo was one of these guys, a fellow Qing Dynasty official, Manchu, Mongol, or Han, all Confucianized, it would be both social and political capital. And there may even be some political capital here as well. It's possible that he's actually thinking about how Paleo, if he has a favorable impression of me, he might go to Beijing and speak high, highly of me to friends in high places who might be able to get me out of exile. But chiefly, this is social capital. And we see it in the excerpts from uh, Zilan's letter to Paleo in Chinese that I've translated for you at the beginning of this chapter and in other parts of this chapter as well. He's very much admiring of Paleo, wants to impress him, wants to be his friend. Right, this is the concept of accumulating culture. It's a phrase coined by historian Patricia Ebry from the University of Washington. Uh, this is how the Confucian elites regard antiquity. We collect them as a means of accumulating culture and demonstrating our cultural sophistication and our claim to being an educated gentleman and a member of polite elite society. That's what separates us from them, them being the dirty, vulgar, illiter illiterate masses who spend their days only in pursuit of money. Now, once Zylon dies, if his family is poor enough, they may view his antiquities as economic capital. If you're in a crisis, if your family's facing an existential crisis, as many Qing officials will face after the 1911 revolution, then it becomes a form of economic capital and you will sell it like Pui will sell it from the Forbidden City and he's living there after 1911. But what about Paleo? Whether Paleo is rich, comfortable, middle class, lower class, or totally destitute, if he's going to remain a scholar, and have a position at a university or a museum and be seen as a preeminent scholar, he can't sell that item. The item, the, the Dunhuang manuscript that Zilan has given him, can only be given to a museum, a library, or a university. That's it. Has to be one of these educational institutions that purports to transform the world by educating the masses and demonstrating our empire or our state's commitment to the enlightenment agenda of science, preservation, and education. So we see two very different modes here, just like in the last chapter. Zylon sees this as a transferable commodity that he will only transfer with another cultivated, educated, educated gentleman, and largely for social capital. Paleo, in turn, will view this as a priceless emblem that cannot change hands in a private transaction ever again. It can only change hands if the next hand that gets it is the hand of a museum, a library, or university, and that's it. Now it represents something larger, something abstract, something collective about our imperial 
or national entity. This is very clear. This is made very clear when Paleo continues out of Xinjiang and goes into the inner heartland of China after the expedition is over. Unlike Stein, he actually continues into the heartland of China. He doesn't go back uh, over the Himalayas back to India or Central Asia. Paleo goes into the eastern seaboard and he meets with Chinese scholars in cities like Shanghai. They have a dinner. He speaks Chinese very well. He gets along with them very well. And he shows them some of his Dunhuang manuscripts. And they're like, oh my God, this is incredible what you found. Unbelievable. And he lets a few of them borrow them. And they're like, can I borrow it for another day, another day? And he's like, all right, that's fine. I, I, I really have to get going now. I need that manuscript back. He will not give it to them as a gift, as Prince Ceylon has given it to him as a gift. And he promises that he'll, when he gets back to Paris, he'll take photographs and send him the photographs of the manuscripts. And he does do that. To his credit, he does actually do that. But that's all he's going to do is give them copies. The original is way too valuable. It's priceless now. It's priceless. All right. Um, now, and the third point about what we want to see here is that the Chinese have already been trying to acquire similar objects themselves for a thousand, perhaps thousands of years. That is to say, unique in the world is that the Chinese have one of the longest perceptions of cultural continuity among uh, of any of any civilization of any people anywhere in the world. It's a perception because there's lots of disjuncture and rupture in Chinese history as well that gets written out of these narratives. Uh, we often, it's very convenient to forget that the earliest Chinese states uh, uh, practiced human sacrifice. Uh, Confucius hadn't been born yet. Buddhism is going to come in later. I mean, there's so many things that change. The idea that there's this continuous Chinese cultural continuity is absolutely ridiculous. But there's a perception of cultural continuity. Chinese characters create the perception of cultural continuity, even when you have half the time non-Chinese northern nomads who are actually running these dynasties. So the perception of cultural continuity is very important. All right. They already want to collect this stuff, just like the Westerners want it. It's not like there's zero competition to collect this stuff. Okay. But there is a difference with the Westerners. One, the Westerners will also covet popular religious art, popular religious art. The Confucian elites have a bias against this. Popular religious art, sculptures and whatnot, uh, you know, Buddhist statuary and this sort of stuff that is generally seen as something for the vulgar superstitious masses, not what a logical, educated, rational Confucian gentleman would, would, would covet or believe in. But the Westerners do actually covet popular religious art as a legitimate form of art, and they'll go after it. So that's one difference with this perception of cultural continuity. The second one is that the Chinese, the Confucian elites, despite this perception of cultural continuity, they have a marked bias against manual labor. And uh, cultivated gentlemen don't do manual labor. They don't get their hands dirty. You're supposed to have light skin, long fingernails that tells everyone, I don't have to work in the fields. I don't have to work under the sun. I work with my brain, not with my hands. And that's prestigious. So what does this mean? It means they're not going to do expeditions. They're not going to do expeditions. Not yet, at least. Not this generation. You need to have a fully westernized generation come of age who's been educated in Western schools before they're going to start saying, seeing the virtues of Western-style expeditions. The Chinese, remember Wan Rong's pref, uh, postface to the, the uh, 1902 Chinese translation of Stein's preliminary report? Um, instead of admiring him, uh, some of my colleagues are laughing at him, crossing rivers and climbing mountains because they're Confucian gentlemen who look down on that manual labor. And he says, don't laugh, stop laughing at him. We need to be like him. We need to be like Mike, <laughs> right? Don't laugh at him. But they are willing to do suburban excavations. Suburban excavations. And here's the map that you see included in the book as well. Where can you do suburban excavations? <laughs> Not in too many places. Turfan, uh, where is it? Turfan, right here. Uh, Turfan is the, is the most likely promising site to do suburban excavations if you're a Chinese official. Most of these sites down here, especially in the south, but also in the north, Kucha, there's some suburban excavations you can do, but most of these sites, it doesn't look like it on the map, they're far away. They're far from the oasis. You leave the oasis and you're going into the frigid desert and you're going to die if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, it's very difficult to get to these sites. Uh, Turfan. Turfan is unique because it's going to be one of the few places in which it doesn't depend on the vagaries of melted mountain glacier water uh, for the viability of the city. It's been around for a long, long time, you know, well over a thousand years, um, and they actually the, the the city has not really moved 
like other cities do. Other cities will have to move and be abandoned when the waters change. Turfan, they had this ingenious system of underground ground, ground canals. You actually dig into the ground, you have this whole underground network of canals uh, that maintains a steady stream of uh, groundwater. Um, so they're not as totally dependent on melted mountain stream water as other oases are, which means it's continually inhabited, which means that you have the antiquities left by previous civilizations within easy reach of the actual city itself. So you can do suburban excavations in Turfan. Remember this because it's gonna be very important in future chapters, not the next one, but the one after that. We're gonna see that when the Chinese officials uh, start to look at a place where they're gonna compete with, with, with Westerners like Stein, they choose to confront him at Turfan because that's one of the few places where it's close to the capital of Urumqi. That's where all the wealthy Chinese live. And you can do easy suburban excavations there. All right, and many Qing Dynasty officials will amass huge collections from Turfan. But unlike the Westerners, they will be dispersed in private networks over the coming decades because you don't have the ideal of putting it into a national museum. You don't even have a national museum yet. All right, now, a big portion of this book, we're looking at the Dunhuang manuscripts that came out of Cave 17 um, and the colophones that were attached to them and what that can tell us about what we're looking at here. Um, so we need, to talk, we, need, we need to introduce Dunhuang. And obviously you can only introduce it so much in the book. Let's give you some visual candy here, some visual candy so you understand where exactly, uh, uh, what, what, what exactly we're looking at here. This is the uh, oasis of the Molgao Grottoes translated as the peerless grottoes. It's not the city of Dunhuang. It's a little bit away from the city of Dunhuang, um, it, uh, you know, a couple of miles. Um, and it's just really, it's out here in the middle of nowhere. All of a sudden you have this river, uh, I think it's called the Dachian River, that flows through right along these uh, limestone cliffs. And this allows for a tiny little sanctuary in which you're going to have uh, a temple that's going to be built and some uh, uh, re residences here for the local monks who are going to take up residence. And then all along this cliffside, you can't really see it here, but we will zoom in, you're going to have hundreds of caves, specifically about 500 caves. Here is that three-story uh, uh, Chinese-style temple. It has a massive Buddha uh, statue inside of it but you can't actually even see all at once. Um, and here, this section here is supposed to be on the left and this one on the bottom is on the right. There's so many caves, I can't even really show it on uh, one line. Um, and you can see the numbers of all of the caves. Now, far off on this side, you're going to find cave 16. Right off of cave 16 is going to be cave 17. Um, all right, and then here's some historical photos. Again, it's just nice to sort of orient ourselves and get a sense of what we're looking at. What it might've looked like too, when Stein and Paleo passed by here in 19, 1907 and 1908 and got a hold of all those manuscripts from the cave library. Uh, here is the three-tiered uh, temple with the large Buddha inside. Early in the 20th century, uh, you can see now it's much more impressive because it's been renovated, but this is what it would have looked like about 100 years ago. Here is, uh, you're looking, that's the river over here. This is the river that runs through the site and makes it viable. This, the, these are the cliffs in the early 20th century before they had scaffolding and paved walkways and all that. You can see where it's very dangerous uh, to try and get into these. Um, uh, a lot of them have completely lost the ladders or you know uh, stairs or scaffolding that would have uh, facilitated access into each of these caves. Um, this is cave 16, right? Cave 16, um, in which you can see uh, this, you know, sort of the, the layout of all of this. All the walls are going to be painted, painted with Buddhist, sometimes Taoist imagery. A lot of political patrons in the city of Dunhuang, not, not far away, are going to inscribe their glory on these cave walls as well, put them in there as patrons of religious art. That gives you good merit for the afterlife. Um, they'll pay for these sort of statues and whatnot and religious rituals and worship will be carried out here. And you'll pay priests to tend to these caves as well and make sure that they don't fall into disrepair. Right over here, this is going to be where cave 17 is. And we're gonna move in here. here here's what it looks like today. Here you can see the vibrant colors, right? Uh, the wonderful vibrant colors um, all along the walls with the Buddhist and Taoist art. Here's the, the, the present day label, Cave 17. Um, the, so this wall originally would have looked like this. All what you see over here on the left, this also would have been right here. It would have been covered with plaster somewhat seamlessly and painted over. Uh, this happened around the year 1000 or so, we believe. Uh, the reasons why this side little chamber was, was, was closed up is uh, you know the subject of vigorous scholarly debate. Um, we think it was 
probably fear of uh, some Muslim invasions that never materialized from Central Asia and that eventually it was forgotten about. Um, and so the things would be left in there for over 900 years without any moisture or anyone tampering them with them whatsoever. Uh, eventually, Wang Yuan Lu, who we're going to see in a minute, the Taoist priest who would take on a precedence at Dunhuang, saw some sort of a crack in the plaster up here and thought there might be something behind it. And he's the one who broke through to see if there was another chamber inside. And he was right. There was. Here it is without all the tourists crowding around. You can actually see the door fully cut out. And you can see originally it was supposed to be a uh, shrine for a Buddhist monk by the name of Hong Bien, who died in the late ninth century AD. Um, and originally this was made for him. It wasn't secret closed off or anything. You had a statue of him in there, you had the nice little paintings on the back, uh, the scenery and whatnot, and this was uh, a monument to a recently departed Buddhist monk in a way to keep his memory alive and, and, and tend to his memory, carry out rituals, um, you know, burn incense, uh, incantations, this sort of stuff. Um, this is the cave inside. You can actually see, if you look up here, you can see the uh, sort of trees and, 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 and the leaves coming out over the manuscripts. I mean, this is an incredible image, right? I mean, the manuscripts just piled up on the wall. Uh, sorry, uh, these are, that's the tree right there. Now the manuscripts today are all gone, obviously. So you're seeing an empty room. And this statue of Hong Bien actually had been removed uh, uh, prior to the sealing up of the cave library in the 20th century. They found it in one of the other caves and put it back here to sort of give you an idea of what it originally would have looked like. Now the manuscripts are gone. You might as well put the statue back in or else it's just an empty room. Uh, but you can see the tree motif in the background. Uh, that's the same tree motif up here when this was all covered with well over 40,000 manuscripts, banners, I mean, all kinds of stuff. Totally stunning. Now, now we finally get to Wang Yuan Lu. You have this picture. It's really the only picture we have of him, take, taken by Oral Stein in 1907. Uh, Wang Yuan was an itinerant Taoist priest who had found his way to Dunhuang by begging and decided to, this is, is going to be his life's work. My, my life has meaning. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to restore the caves. I'm going to restore the caves for merit. Uh, Buddhist and Taoist merit. He's a Taoist priest, but Buddhism and Taoism have lots of syncretism, lots of overlapping. He wouldn't have seen any contradiction whatsoever of being Taoist, but most of the stuff being Buddhist, uh, that's totally fine. Um, and so he thought, I'm going to build my merit. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to find meaning in my life. My great enterprise is going to be to restore the caves. They were largely abandoned. The local nearby town, the peasants who lived in Dunhuang town, only visited once a year, usually in May, for a religious festival. So they are actively worshipped. There is an incentive to, to protect the caves and improve them for the sake of the local populace. And you can beg in town for donations to help restore this, and you will get the gratitude of the local people for maintaining the caves. Remember this later on when Langdon Warner goes there and uh, tries to cut out some of the murals. This is an actively worshipped site, but it's also can seem abandoned much of the year, but it's really not. But it kind of seems like it is, and it's in terrible repair. It's very derelict. Now, Wang Yan Lu's discovery of the secret cave library, now known as Cave 17, um, is uh, kind of similar to the discovery of the Oracle Bones, which we talk about in the Lost Treasures of China. Um, I mean, they're both kind of stumbled upon by chance by illiterate peasants, Wang cannot read, by illiterate peasants or illiterate lower class people um, in 1899 for the Oracle Bones and 1900 for Cave 17. I mean, it's, all, it's, it's remarkable. Within a year of each other, these things come to light. And then the local people who found it, who are not highly educated scholars, regard it purely as economic capital. And they sell it to the highest outside bidder, uh, outside bidder regardless of the nationality of that bidder. They don't say these, these are emblems of the Chinese nation. I want to profit off of it because I found it, but I can only sell it to Chinese. No. They're not regarding it like that. They're uneducated. Even if they were at this time period, they're not educated in a nationalist mode like we are today. Finders keepers. I'm not a scholar, so I don't really read historical intellectual agendas into it. This is economic capital, and I'll sell it to anyone uh, who is willing to buy it uh, from me. Now, what's interesting, here are some of the pile of the manuscripts, photograph taken by Stein when he takes many of them out uh, and it starts to catalog them and look through them. Here you can get a little close up picture of what it looked like originally in 1907. What's amazing about this is that there's no particular reason why either stash, either the Oracle Bones in, in, in the heartland or the Dunhuang Cave Library had to be found at this time period. Because from the Chinese perspective, in hindsight today, this is the worst possible time for these things to be found. Oh, if only the cave library of Dunhuang had been found in the year 1700 <laughs> and not 1900. 
then eventually the Chinese would have gotten them all. All right, but no, it was found in 1900, and it turned out that the Westerners would be the first to get their hands to go to the site directly and and encounter Wang Yuanlu. All right, so from the Chinese perspective, both the Oracle Bones and Cave 17, terrible timing. It's not like there was some sort of new new uh, uh, you know industrial development or digging up of sites for new skyscrapers or some new technological development that led that inevitably led to the discovery of these things. It was just peasants stumbling upon them, which could have happened at any point in the last thousand years. But it happened to happen (laughs) at the turn of the 20th century. From the Chinese perspective, terrible timing, terrible luck. From the Westerners perspective, wonderful. This couldn't have been better. Now, what's Wang's strategy? What's Wang Yuanlu's strategy? His strategy is to donate. He he is firm in his uh, 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 desire to make sure that he is seen in more lofty terms than the elites will see him. He doesn't think of himself as some dirty, illiterate peasant. He wants to think of himself in lofty terms as engaged in a higher abstract mission uh, that is germane to his place in life as a Taoist priest. And he says, I want donations. And he says the word donation. I want donations in exchange for these manuscripts. I'm not selling them to you for cold, hard cash that I'm gonna go use to buy a Ferrari. I want, I'm gonna give them to you in exchange for a donation to this religious site. And I will use your money to restore the caves. And let's give him some credit, all right? Despite anything else he does, despite whatever the Chinese nationalist view of him is today, there's no evidence he ever spent a single dime of any money he ever got on worldly luxuries. The way he looks here in 1907 is pretty much how he looked for the rest of his life until he dies in 1930. There is zero evidence that he did anything to make his life more comfortable. So by and large, this does seem to be a genuine pious agenda that he's pursuing here. But still, he's a shrewd businessman because he wants to get the greatest donation he can possibly get. So first he says, I'm gonna, Stein and Paleo in 1900, they aren't anywhere, you know, they're they're not in Dunhuang. He says, how can I turn this into economic capital? How can I make it useful to my religious agenda, to my great enterprise of restoring the Dunhuang caves? He says, I'll donate them, I'll send them, to Chinese officials nearby. I know they're going to appreciate them in an educated mode that I can't. And hopefully when they see these generous gifts that I'm giving them, they'll make a donation in return to the temple and my restoration efforts. Okay, Um, what is his strategy? How is he gonna maximize uh, his appeal to the Confucian gentlemen in the nearby cities? He, He chooses the most beautiful calligraphic specimens, the calligraphy, because he can't read them. He doesn't know what's in these. He doesn't know which ones are Buddhist sutras and which ones are historical secular documents of literature or government records or whatnot. He has no idea. So he says, I'm just going to find the ones that have the most beautiful calligraphy. I do know that the the elite Confucian gentlemen, they appreciate calligraphy. They look on calligraphy as a window into a man's soul and his personality. So if I find the best ones that have the most beautiful writing, maybe they'll be impressed and that'll increase the chances that they will give me a nice donation. Now, uh, here is just some example of uh, sort of the beautiful calligraphy on the sutras, so the sort of things that he's looking at and saying, yep, I'm going to send this one to the Chinese official or the local military official, see if he's going to give me a donation. Now, despite his cleverness, uh, he, it, it completely fails. His strategy fails, uh, though he gives out several tens probably several hundreds of sutras and manuscripts out as gifts to local Chinese officials. Not one of them gives him a dime. Not one. So he stops sending them around as gifts. To hell with you guys. You're not going to give me anything? Fine. Ungrateful, (laughs) snobby bastards. Um, However, he also took precautions, we now know, to ensure that no Chinese official came knocking on his door. This is really awesome. I'm not going to give you a dime, but can you please tell me where you got these from? Because I would love to get some more. He wants to make sure that, okay, that was a lost cause. I tried that and it failed. They didn't give me anything, but I still got 40,000 more of these in store. Uh, Let's make sure I don't lose those. And when eventually the time is right and there's a customer who comes around, I'll be able to sell them, sorry, get a donation uh, for them. Um, So apparently he gave the impression to the Chinese officials, we don't know the details of this, but we do know that the Chinese officials believed 
that there were only a few hundred manuscripts in Cave 17. The diary of Ye Chang Chu, we've had uh, some Chinese historians uh, read this guy's diary. He was a high official in Gansu province. That's the province that uh, Dunhuang is in. He was a high ranking official uh, traveling around. He got some of the Dunhuang manuscripts, the ones gifted away by Wang in his hands, because once he, he, he Wang uh, gives them his gifts to Chinese officials for a donation, they then keep giving him his gifts in their own private and professional networks. Ye Chang Chu gets one by one of these means. And he writes in his diary, uh, uh, something that reveals what the knowledge was at the time period about where these came from. And he says, and I quote this in this chapter, um, that uh, it, you know, it seems that there's only a couple hundred of these. They were already divided up by the local monks themselves. And that's it. They're all gone. So they're not going to give them any money. They're not going to give them a, a donation. And they also think that that was it. This handful of manuscripts that were sent out by Wang Yun Lu, um, that's all there was. So we're not going to go take a look. You don't even have to really do an expedition to get there. Uh, the oasis of the Thousand Buddha Caves, the Mulgao Grottoes, it's just the same name for the exact same site, it's just a few miles away from Dunhuang town. And there is a Chinese magistrate who was posted to the town of Dunhuang. He could have easily visited the caves. And he didn't. He didn't believe there was anything there. There's a little bit of that. Uh, we laugh at the gentleman who goes out and uh, sort of fraternizes with the uh, illiterate peasants and whatnot and gets their hands dirty. Uh, there's probably a little bit of that elite bias from the old Confucian gentleman still in there as well. So when Stein and Paleo come knocking on the door in 1907 and 1908, Wang has been waiting seven years fruitlessly for some sort of big donation. He wants to leverage these things into economic capital so he can restore, do pious restoration work on the 500 caves at Dunhuang, which as you saw, were in terrible shape. So now he's ready to sell them in the form of a donation, of course, all right? Now, unlike the Chinese officials who don't do expeditions and themselves alerted Stein and Paleo to the Dunhuang manuscripts, Stein and Paleo investigate the source in person. Remember that? Not only did the Chinese officials not go themselves, they also revealed to Stein and Paleo, hey, look at this. Remember, Paleo got a gift. Stein also got a gift from a local Chinese official. They wanted to impress him, and they said, here, here's a gift of a Dunhuang manuscript. We, these are really valuable. They're ancient, um, but we believe there's no more. Stein and Paleo are emblematic of a different way of looking at this, a different spirit of enterprise. I have to say it. They probably are, in which they say, well, I'm not going to take this claim at face value. I'm going to go check out the caves. Maybe they're all gone. Maybe that's true. But if they're not, if there's more, holy shit, that's going to be an incredible find. So Stein is first. Stein is first. He goes in 1907, finds Wang Yuan Lu, and lo and behold, yes, there's a lot more. And Wang opens up because now he's, hey, this guy's got money. And he's willing to pay. What to Wang is incredible amounts of money for something that he only sees in economic terms. And then Paleo comes the very next year in 1908, the exact same thing. Each of these guys are going to get close to 10,000 manuscripts. There's Paleo. Uh, Wang grants him access to look through the manuscripts himself. And Paleo, because he actually reads Chinese, unlike Stein, is able to figure out exactly what the best ones are and takes what is generally considered to be the cream of the crop. All right, this is precisely the spirit of Western scientific investigation that Wan Rong in his postface to the 1902 Chinese translation of Stein's preliminary report, it's precisely the Western scientific investigative spirit that he said Confucian officials were laughing at. He's basically, and he can say, if we forded rivers and endured cold weather and got our hands dirty as well, we never, we never would have lost so many treasures. Lastly here, I want to show you some pages again from Stein's diary to give you a sense of the shrewd businessman that Wang Yuan Lu was, because he's often portrayed as a stupid simpleton um, who sold out the Chinese nation. All right, one, there's no such thing as the Chinese nation. He doesn't believe in it. The, China, the uh, uh, Qing dynasty elites don't believe in the Chinese nation either. They're thinking in class terms, all right, just like David Canadine and ornamentalism. We talked about that. Um, so that's bogus. Uh, he's also not a simpleton. He's a shrewd businessman. We might refer to him by the term that I prefer, subsistence diggers, as a way of not denigrating them with a label of, a pejorative label of tomb raider, uh, grave robbers, uh, uh, treasure seekers. That's a sort of a subtle pejorative way to denigrate people and say that what they're doing is illegitimate. The way that I interact with the past is legitimate. Um, here is Stein's uh, uh, diary entries from when he's negotiating with Wang Yuan Lu. And, and, uh, and he very much reveals 
that Wong is a shrewd businessman. He wants a donation. He wants to couch it in form of a donation, um, but he also wants to get as much money as possible. He's not going to be screwed over by uh, uh, outsiders. Here we have over here, May 28th, 1907. He now clamored for subscription. That's a donation. Subscription to the temple, but declared session of any king. That's the old way of writing Jing or Sutra, uh, religious manuscripts, uh, impossible. Lengthy negotiations on plain trade basis. And you can also see he's saying, oh no, these are more valuable. Uh, you can't get these. Uh, he's, he's jacking up the price until Stein agrees to pay more. June 6, negotiations about purchase of supplementary bundles. Dao Shi, that's it means Taoist priest in Chinese. Dao Shi asks for 200 sares or 500 ruples for 50. Double the price of the previous lot. And he is to keep them. <laughs> Later on, in another diary entry I didn't include here, Stein goes back and says, uh, Wang is still the old, the old tough customer of before. And we see, as every single scholar ends up showing up, Wang keeps doubling the price with every single one of them and convincing them, just like he convinced the Chinese officials that this is the last of the lot. When you say something is the last of the lot, the last, the, the last item on the shelf, you can charge more for it. It was never the last one. Well, eventually it was. But for most of these people, he had more in store and hid them and convinced the people that there were actually no more. And therefore, the price went up. And each person who came to Wang Yuanlu realized that each one of these uh, uh, was actually uh, the price had gone up from previous explorers. And they all sort of, you know, were lamenting this. Now, all right, let's move on beyond this. What can... The Dunhuang and Turfan colophones tell us. That's the subject of chapter two, accumulating culture. I have to say this was the hardest research and the hardest chapter I've ever written in my entire career. Uh, it was extremely painful to read this handwriting uh, in classical Chinese. Uh, the grammar is difficult. The characters are often rare and very literary. Uh, the handwriting is tough to decipher. Um, I just recently had to go back for a Chinese translation of this chapter and supply all the original uh, Chinese characters for this. You're getting the English translations of it. And oh my God, what a headache that was. Uh, anyways, it's done. Uh, what are we looking at here? These colophones um, are what the Chinese who got the manuscripts that Wang Yuan Lu sent out and remained in China or later emerged from the digs at Turfan or later came on the market in Dunhuang from Cave 17. Those two sources, Turfan or Dunhuang. The ones that remained in China were not taken away by foreign scholars and went into museums overseas. These colophones are a window into how the educated elite Chinese treated art and antiquities as a private form of social and political capital. And if the apocalypse hits, a form of economic capital. That's what these represent. We're going to see how the Chinese are interacting with these things so we understand better how they're willing to let Westerners take them away and not regard that Westerner as a thief. That's what this is all leading to. Now, Chinese colophones have a long history. Uh, again, there's that perception of cultural continuity at work here. Um, here we see an example of what we're looking at. Um, what you have here on the right is an ancient sutra. This is something that came from Cave 17. It's a sutra. A sutra spoken by the Buddha on the names of the Buddha. That's a very well-known Buddhist uh, uh, religious scripture. This on the right is like a thousand years old, probably more than a thousand years old. This on the left, these three lines over here, that is a modern day colophone in Chinese tiba. A colophone is a fancy word for a postscript. It just means it's notations added on to the end of a manuscript. That's all it is. All right, so this is like from 1910 or 1912, right? This is like from the year 912. Huge difference here. Okay, now the very act of writing a colophone itself demonstrates a lot to us. That tells us a lot. The fact that whoever had this in their possession felt that it was okay to add these three lines on the manuscript itself. That tells us something. Do you think Stein would have felt comfortable writing his thoughts? Oh, I just met with you know those diary entries. Do you think he would have wrote, he would have written on the Dunhuang manuscripts, uh, you know, Wang, the tough customer before, he's now asking double the price, and he would put that right here in English? Hell no. 
because he views this as a priceless artifact. Its natural life cycle has ended. Now it's a representation of Great Britain's commitment to enlightenment ideals, and it'll be put behind a glass cabinet in the British Museum or British Library for to transform the masses and educate them and better them. That's his lofty agenda, right? Um, and you can't, you can't insert yourself into the, the artifact anymore. You have to be detached from it. It's a sterile museum piece now that you analyze with detached scientific analysis. The Chinese know this is a precious commodity, belongs to me. It's a reflection of my virtue, the fact that I have acquired it somehow. I recognize its value. I'm willing to put out the resources to get it. That tells you how great of a scholar and a gentleman that I am. And it's a reflection of my individual virtue to have this. They do the same thing with paintings. You can insert yourself into it. Put your seal on it. Put a colophon on it here. You know, these colophons are not very lofty. Sometimes they're poems and whatnot by famous people, but oftentimes it's just, I visited my friend's house today. He pulled this out. Wow, how beautiful it is. That's usually what the colophon content is about. More often than not, it's very banal. It's not some, if you don't know Chinese or whatnot, you're looking at this like, oh, this is all so beautiful. It's all a work of art. And that may be one way that it's perceived, but I'm just letting you know, usually these colophones are not these lofty poetic sentiments. They're quite banal observations about what I did today, how I came to find to, to, to view this, um, usually visiting a friend's house, and he unrolled it for, uh, uh, for me to look at it. And wow, isn't it beautiful? I'm going to write some thoughts here. Today, we would regard a modern, a modern colophone. This here, all the seals, this here, this here, we would regard this here today and the Chinese today, because now they're westernized. We would all regard this as vandalism today. It's vandalism. This isn't art. It's vandalism. But this was a commonplace social and political activity. It was a way that educated elite gentlemen bonded with one another. So here's a question. When would you expect the last modern colophon to be added onto an ancient Chinese manuscript from Dunhuang or Turfan to be? I asked this question myself because I was curious. If adding a colophon is indicative of a certain state of mind, and it's the state of mind we want to know, right? Because we know that you don't shoot your way in or get shot out for these archaeological expeditions. The host people have to say yes or they have to say no. So it's a state of mind. How does the mind change? So the colophones are a window into the Chinese mind, why they're saying yes, why they're saying no, why they're not doing this as the property of the nation, why it's not theft, and then why it will be theft later on. So when do they regard manuscripts differently? Not as private ownership, a reflection of my virtue that I can transfer another individual if I want, even if he is a foreigner, as long as he's an educated gentleman, that's fine. When does that mindset end? Well, surprisingly enough, well, not surprisingly, it makes complete sense. The last colophon that I found on any of Dunhuang or Turfan manuscript, modern colophon from the 20th century, is when the first is when the last generation of pre-westernized Chinese elites, that is to say, the last generation of old imperial style Confucian officials raised before the heyday of Western influence. When they die off, so too do modern day colophones added on to this. It's in the 1940s. It's in the 1940s. That's when they die off. And after that, the Chinese, who have now come of age in a time in which they're receiving a Western education and thinking about these things the same way Westerners do, as political emblems of our nation, priceless, they too then adopt the attitude that says colophones are a form of vandalism. Oh, ancient colophones are beautiful. You know, if it's already been done, it's beautiful and it's historical. Uh, but now, to do it now, that's vandalism. Same viewpoint, because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to an abstract collective entity and is a symbol of our commitment to an abstract, lofty, virtuous agenda. All right. So in addition to the act of writing the colophon itself and what that already tells us about how the Confucian elites interact with manuscripts and how they're predisposed to see it as okay for Westerners to take these things to as emblems of their private virtue, how does the content of these colophones illustrate a precious valuation but not a priceless one? That is something that's precious, valuable, but I'm willing to transfer it to someone else in exchange for social or political capital, whereas the Westerner is not. It's going into a museum, library, or university, and that's the end of its life history. It will never leave that glass cabinet again unless it's being taken out with tweezers <laughs> uh, to be studied. Well, let's take a look at some of the content of these. They document how these things actually changed hands. 
and are engaged. Here we see the uh, line saying, this is a colophon. This is one of the most famous ones, one of the longest ones from 1910, Zhao Weixi, a traveling Qing Dynasty official. How can I ever forget the generosity of the garrison commander who gave this to me? Why did he give it to me? Because he wants me to be loyal to him, to admire him, to see him as a man of culture. And the next time there's some sort of shakeup in the imperial bureaucracy, I'm going to be in his clique. I'm going to be on his side, and I'm and, and and this him giving me this gift of this ancient sutra demonstrates that he sees me as his colleague, and that I'm worthy of appreciating this as well. It's it, it's the glue, it's the social glue that binds the Confucian elites together. It's a symbol of their social relations and helps reinforce that. That is a form of capital. They have colophone parties. I love this phrase. They have colophone parties all the time. Let's invite 10 friends over to my house, and I'm going to show them how much I appreciate their erudition and their intelligence and their cultivation by unrolling my Dunhuang or Turfan manuscripts. And they're going to look at it, admire it, say, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. You're so fortunate to have this. I'm so glad I'm your friend. What, 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 what a great scholar and gentleman you are that you managed to acquire this. I'm going to put my thoughts down here. And these are mostly pretty banal. He's basically all these, it's one after the other. I mean, this is a colophon. This is one, this is one, this is one, this is one. Here, this guy's trying to really show it off. He's trying to write in an old style seal script to show off how, you know, bright of a scholar he is. I, I can write in the old seal style. Uh, almost all of these are basically the equivalent of Justin Jacobs, I was here, <laughs> May 13th, 2021. That's what most of these are. Uh, but sometimes they'll, they'll talk about other things. But you want to insert yourself into the artifact once more. It's still a living artifact. You show off your appraisal of calligraphy. Here's a longer one by Wang Chunan, the financial commissioner in uh, the Xinjiang government in the first decade of the 20th century. Here he is showing off his appreciation and how he can analyze ancient calligraphy. You can see, you can, you, you can read this for yourself. You have this in the chapter as well. Uh, he's even naming, drop, he's, he's, he's name dropping famous calligraphers from antiquity, from eight, seven, 900 years ago. Um, uh, to so I think I even know who the calligrapher was, who was, you know, sort of the master of this particular style. And then you see him here also, these are going to be gifts once more. Zhao Weixi received this as a gift, and you can already see he's preparing one day for when it's going to be given as a gift to his own children. He ends it with, my, my descendants should cherish this forever. Uh, do they? No. We know this eventually ends up in uh, a bookshop in Beijing. So presumably Zhao Weixi's children uh, eventually became destitute, uh, or at least not as comfortable, and they decided that they were going to sell their dad's Dunhuang manuscript uh, in order to make some money uh, for their livelihood. You don't want to do that if you don't have to, but if you face an economic crisis, you absolutely will do that. All right. Conspicuously absent in the content of these colophones, no mention of libraries, universities, or museums. What are the consequences of the absence of these institutions? What we have merely survived by chance, and it suggests that many more were destroyed or disappeared. Because you don't have libraries, museums, or universities that these things can be given to in the name of the nation and put behind glass cabinets and belong to the collective abstract entity of the nation, um, that, that, that has consequences because Stein and Paleo are, are, are taking it away and putting it behind glass cabinets. They're still there to this day, every single one of them. Okay. Um, but what happens to a lot of these is that they're destroyed. They're lost. Remember the date of the earliest surviving colophon. It's this one, 1910. But when did Wang Yuan Lu start giving them away from cave 17? From 1900 and 1907. And remember, Wang Yuan Lu was shrewd. He gave away the prettiest ones and the most complete ones, precisely the sort that the people who owned it would be most likely to unfurl at a colophone party to impress their friends and have them add new colophones to them. What happened to all these? Why is the earliest colophone from 1910 if Wang Yuan Lu probably gave out a couple hundred of them, the most beautiful ones, the most perfect ones, aesthetically pleasing ones, for 10 years, for seven years before this, he would have stopped in 1907 when he realized he could sell them to white people instead and get a lot of money. Then he would have stopped giving them to Chinese officials. So what happened to those for seven years? Well, look no further than this colophon, which I included an image of in the book. Shui Li in 1930 
says that after he came back to the inner provinces from Gansu, which is the province that Dunhuang is in, uh, he said that my friends competed with one another to cut off their own peace. Yo Ren, my friends, Zheng Xiang Ge Lie, right there. So that all that remains is this portion. They cut it into pieces, right? Again, because it's, it's a private reflection of your personal virtue. You own this, it doesn't belong to the nation and you can transfer it if you'd like to. And the most drastic way that you can transfer it is say, well, I have five friends that I want to impress, uh, who I want to think highly of me, but I've only got one Dunhuang manuscript. <sighs> Let me cut it up. And that's exactly what they might do. Cut it up into fragments and give each friend one of these fragments. Uh, so that's why I call it one manuscript, endless social capital. Consider the wear and tear on these manuscripts as well. Because they circulate within private and professional networks, they move with the official who has it. It's not being stationary in a box or a cabinet in a museum. This is from Zhao Wei Xi's manuscript. This is one of his later colophones. Here we have again, he's trying to, uh, this middle portion here, trying to impress people with his knowledge of ancient seal script, a different script. Here he is back to his sloppy handwriting again. Uh, here he talks about, not only is he taking his manuscript with him as he travels, um, here he went hunting turkeys during the day, came back, took out his manuscript and read through it to atone for his sins of taking a form of life during the day. You can imagine. Not only is this manuscript accompanying this guy for thousands of miles in the course of his official career, he's taking it out night after night after night to show his friends so they can add colophones to repent for killing a yellow turkey earlier that day uh, for all kinds of things. So what does this all have to do with Stein and Paleo and their removal of some 20,000 manuscripts from Cave 17? It shows the way in which elite Chinese were predisposed to treat any cultured gentleman the way they already treated each other. That's the important point of this chapter. As long as Stein and Paleo and everyone else was deemed worthy of having these objects in their possession, as long as Stein and Paleo and other Western scholars expressed admiration for what these manuscripts revealed about Chinese civilization and history, and Stein and Paleo did. They were seen as cultivated, educated gentlemen who knew their history and would study these things, just like the Confucian gentlemen would study them. If those conditions are met, then foreign scholars could join the hunt for these manuscripts and treat their manuscripts as the Chinese treated them, what appears to be per private property. It's not. Because Stein and Paleo will then nationalize it and put it into an imperial institution, and it's not their personal property. But that doesn't matter. The, the mechanism by which we got to that stage was that the Chinese regarded these things as finders keepers. And if you get it by gift, by finding it, by purchasing it, it's yours. You can do whatever the hell you want with it, just like we do. We circulate it around among our friends as well. And it's also finder's keeper, private property, reflection of private virtue for us. And the colophones illustrate this because we can insert ourselves into it and get social. And they, they show the Chinese squeezing political and social capital out of artifacts and saying to the Westerners, you can do this too. And it's not criminal to do it because this is how we do it. And you're just a mirror image of us. They just not really necessarily thinking that, oh, you're gonna put this in a museum and it's never gonna come back again. That, that, that might not have occurred to them. So here, here's a, here's a letter from uh, Magistrate Wan Ming to Stein in 1925, sort of illustrating this point, that they acknowledge that you're an educated gentleman, a scholar. You're going to use this to appreciate, to better understand and appreciate Chinese history. That's a lofty admission that I support and admire and respect. You're not a thief. He says, the history of the Han and Tang dynasties in Xinjiang have also benefited from your surveys and research. This is no small accomplishment. Can it not be compared to when paper became expensive in Luoyang? He's even using a Chinese literary trope. This is a famous Chinese literary trope that was used to, in, to indicate any uh, book or work of literature that sold very well to the point where uh, so many copies had to be made that uh, the city ran out of paper. It originally was used for a Chinese poem. 
I think fourth, fifth century AD, that was so popular, it was recopied so often that paper became expensive in the city of Loyang because everyone wanted to have paper to copy their own, to have their own copy of this famous poem. Um, and this magistrate is using this Chinese literary trope the way that Chinese describe how they interact with antiquities to describe Stein. He's saying your books are uh, gonna be the same. Your books are so well read and so erudite that isn't it the same as when paper became expensive in Loyang. So many people are gonna be buying your books because you're such a great scholar that the price of paper is gonna go up as a result of this. So the colophones provide yet another valuable source for recovering Chinese voices and their views on Stein and paleo and by extension, everyone else. Okay, because if we don't have this, if all we have are these private letters, remember here's Li Shurong from the Oasis of Barakal. I have this letter reprinted in the book as well, although now you can see it with its sort of color, the, the, the hues in there and whatnot. You could probably dismiss those private letters as, ah, they're just being nice. This is standard Confucian guest culture. Come on, stop reading into this, Professor Jacobs. You're taking these flattering letters that are trying to sort of, you know, scratch the back of Stein and Paleo and you're acting like, you know, so the Chinese didn't think this was theft. Of course they sent the letters and then to themselves, they said, these guys are thieves. God, these horrible imperialists. When can we stop writing these humiliating friendly letters to them and tell them what we really think of them? Remember, we need as many sources as possible that are Chinese voices of Chinese voices speaking to other Chinese, not to the Westerners. So we can understand what they thought when they were among themselves. And the colophones, give us a yet, yet another version of a Chinese voice. These colophones are definitely not being read by Stein or Paleo. They're just for other Chinese eyes. So in that sense, they really do give us a valuable Chinese voice to supplement all the other evidence that we've got. And the Chinese voices recovered here reinforce the general views of the pre-Westernized Confucian elites that we've documented elsewhere. They're we're constructing a larger picture here based on all the different local voices that we're finding. That is to say, at their best, they saw the Westerners with admiration and enthusiasm. At the worst, it was morally neutral indifference. But they never regarded them as criminals. That's the important thing to understand. That's what we're recovering that's what we've lost over time is the understanding that we regard them as criminals because we think differently now. The reason these things are so successful is because they absolutely were not regarded like that originally. That's how the Westerners were so successful. All right, we find here also mentioned in this chapter as well, prior to the 1920s, I have not found a single instance of any Chinese writing about the Westerners with criminalized words. They never call it plunder. They never call it theft. It's he took this away. He transported this back to France. He obtained this. And they use the Chinese verbs that are equivalent to those English translations. You don't find the Chinese words, the, the criminalized lexicon until the 1920s, until the first westernized generation of Chinese comes of age. In the era before nationalism, this is your view. Here's Wang Shunan, uh, again, the Xinjiang uh, financial commissioner in the first decade of the 20th century. He writes a huge compendium, a record of antiquities in Xinjiang in 1911. Here we have a classic, wonderful example of the views of this generation of Chinese. Unfortunately, he's talking about the manuscripts that came out of Turfan. And uh, uh, I think it's just Turfan here. Um, unfortunately, most of them were taken by foreigners. Taken. Here we are. Xi Duo Wei Xi Ren De. Unfortunately, see, most were obtained, taken, obtained by Westerners. However, however, the earth does not love its treasures. I love that line. Di bu ai bao, right here. The earth does not love its treasures. Afterwards, who knows how many more will emerge from the soil? He's saying it's, it's, it's an open season. The manuscripts, no one owns these things. The only way that Stein and Paleo could be considered a thief by the Chinese in 1910, in 1911, would be if they broke into Wang Shunan's home or Prince Zilan's home and stole his antiquities from his cabinet. That is the only way they could be seen as a thief. The, simple, the concept of stealing from the Chinese nation did not exist. 
And this illustrates it. The earth does not love its treasures. Who knows how many more will emerge from the soil? More will be out there. Let's go get the next round because it's finders keepers. After nationalism, after the 1920s, it's not going to be the earth does not love it. Uh, the earth does not love its treasures. So anyone who wants it, go out there and get it. Finders keepers. No, no, no. After nationalism, this phrase will be very different. The phrase will become, this earth is Chinese earth and everything that emerges from it belongs to the Chinese. That is the post-nationalist equivalent of this phrase from 1911. It's not that the earth is indifferent to who owns this and what lies beneath the earth can go to anyone. It's that this earth is Chinese. And even before anything emerges from it, whatever's down there, it belongs to China and the Chinese. And if anyone who's not Chinese removes it, or if it ever leaves the borders of the Chinese nation as we define it, that's theft. That's where we're going just 10, 15 years after this sentiment. Of course, there was certainly regret. I'm not trying to say the Chinese were thrilled that Stein and Paleo got all this stuff. No, they weren't thrilled. Unfortunately, that's what he says. Regret, misfortune, is not the same as calling someone a thief. They regretted the loss, but they did not criminalize the loss of what had been taken from China. That's the important thing. This distinction is clearest in the Chinese reactions to Stein and Paleo's activities at Cave 17 that we see in the letters, government documents, and in the colophones in this chapter. Regret, sometimes shame, sometimes envy, sometimes jealousy, sometimes admiration, but not theft. Paleo was embraced by the Chinese even after they knew what he had done and what he had taken and that he wasn't going to give it to them. They were still on great terms with him. Paleo was on wonderful terms with all Chinese scholars for the rest of his life. It didn't, they didn't say, oh my God, you're taking this. You're not going to give it back to us. You're a thief. I never want to talk to you again. What a horribly, morally repugnant man. No. No. Stein too. They do this in 1907 and 1908. Stein comes back for another expedition in 1913. By then, he's published his book, Desert Ru uh, what is it called? De uh, Ruins of Desert Cafe. That's the popular account of his second expedition and the cave library. He's very explicit in what he took. He's got photographs, the same photographs I put here. It was taken from that book. He sent these books to Chinese officials. They knew what he had done. And they let him back in and embrace them as they did before. They didn't say, oh, oh my God, this book is evidence in a criminal trial. He, if he tries to come back in again, you send him away or put him in chains. No, they welcomed him back and the same thing happened again on the third expedition. Surprisingly, who was the only person the Chinese called a thief in these colophones and in other writings? You got it, Wang Yanlu. He's consistently denigrated. Whenever the Chinese of this era blame someone for the loss of the treasures, they don't blame Stein and Paleo. Because in their eyes, Stein and Paleo are doing exactly what they would have done. They're cultivated gentlemen who are seeing a great opportunity to get valuable historical materials, and they got it. And they didn't criminalize that. They criminalize the economic lower classes. Once again, class is almost always so much important than what we often superficially fixate on. Superficial skin colors and this sort of stuff, ethnicity, race, usually it's class that matters more. And that's what we see here. They blame Wang Yanlu. Remember the language that we see here. Uh, the Chinese officials, the Confucian officials referring to people like us. People like us are not just other Confucian elites. It's also the educated Western gentlemen. They are also people like us. Transnational or transimperial bonding. Like we saw in David Canadine's book, and the talking about the elites of the British Empire, Lord Curzon with the local Indian notable with their dead tigers. That's your transnational and bonding. That's people like us. Wang Yuan Lu is not a person like us. This lays the groundwork. This is why this chapter comes before the next one. This lays the groundwork for the compensations of cooperation at a higher economic class among gentlemen of empire. And that's the next chapter.
Now, we're not going to do an illustrated lecture for that. We have a podcast episode for uh, Chapter 3, Gentlemen of Empire, that really covers it, uh, most of the stuff in good detail, not everything, but you're going to read the chapter, and you'll have the major points, again, reinforced by uh, uh, the third podcast episode, Who Enabled Indiana Jones? So we're not going to have an illustrated lecture, but I'll be back for Chapter 4, The Priceless, Na the Priceless Nation, When Everything Begins to Change and the Valuation Within China of These Things Goes Finally from Profitable or Precious, also to priceless. And that's going to be the age of obstruction and intractable conflict. All right, take care till then.